So we just finished even and odd. And today I'm lecturing online. My road is very icy. I'm not going to drive down it. Uh, it was snowy yesterday when I drove down it and it was dangerous. So today, this morning is icy and it's going to be even worse. Uh, so I won't be in class today. This will just be our lecture. And tomorrow, Friday, we're going to have our quiz. We'll cover one, one, and one, two. So we just finished our even odd. We did periodic right before that. And we're on to Pythagorean identities. You probably notice I cannot talk and write at the same time. So Pythagorean identities, cos squared plus sine squared equals one. That is our first and certainly most popular Pythagorean identity. Uh, one plus tangent squared, or I'll write as tangent squared plus one equals secant squared. Tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. And uh, cotangent squared theta plus one equals cosecant squared theta. So these hopefully are already memorized. If they're not, uh, you only need to memorize the first two to get to the third one you co the second one. So what I mean, tangent becomes cotangent, one stays as one, and secant becomes cosecant. So if you can remember tangent squared plus one equals secant squared, you just cotangent, cosecant, and you'll be down here at the third one. So there's a whole lot more identities <clears throat> that we're not going to be using. Uh, what we will use, uh, the only more obscure ones we're going to be using are the half angle formulas. So we'll write those down. And they are cos squared theta equals 1 plus cos 2 theta over 2, and the other one, sine squared theta, equals 1 plus sine 2 theta over 2. Now here we have exponents on the left, this cos squared and sine squared on the left, and on the right, these are coefficients. So there are some ways to, so obviously exponents should be written small and higher up. Coefficient should be written big and on the same line, the same level as uh, what's around it. Another way you can make this more obvious is you can wrap parentheses around uh, 2 theta and 2 theta. And cosine squared, there's not really another way to write it. If you want, you can write it as cos theta whole thing squared. And sine theta, you can write it as sine theta whole thing squared, if that works better for you. You're going to see that when we get into some chain rules that we're going to actually explicitly write our exponents just like this right here that I did in the blue. Uh, in pre-calculus, or pre-calculus 2 class, I talked about the notation being misleading, exponential notation being misleading for trig functions, and it will uh, come up again in calculus class when we start to get into the chain rule, which is, uh, I believe, chapter 4. So... Just be mindful about the alternative ways to write cos squared and sine squared. You may not have memorized these half angle formulas, and that's okay. Uh, you can memorize them now. There's only two of them that we're going to be using. There's a whole lot more identities you don't really need for uh, this quarter. So if you can keep these memorized, you'll be okay. You won't really need them until, I believe, chapter 5. So it'll be a little while until you actually need to use these. Uh, and then calc 2, you'll definitely use them. Uh, but in calc 2, I'll give you a cheat sheet. So we're going to go for some inequalities. And these will most likely be new for all of you. So these are some trig inequalities. And these were generally not seen in pre-calculus class. So we're going to go uh, for any angle.
theta in radians. It's important on this that you're in radians because we're about to measure, uh, what do we call those, arcs uh, around the, the circle, the unit circle. So we're about to measure uh, distance around the circumference, not the full circumference, but part of it, and we call that an arc. So let's write the inequalities down and then see how they, uh, how we arrive at them, why are they true? So that is one, negative absolute value theta, less or equal to sine theta, less or equal to absolute value theta. The other one, negative absolute value theta, less or equal to one minus cos theta, less or equal to uh, absolute value theta. <clears throat> now, when theta is really big, for example, uh, sine theta is never going to be smaller than negative one or bigger than positive one. So sine theta doesn't get very big. So if theta and negative theta are bigger than one or smaller than negative one, uh, this will always be true. No matter what, sine is not going to be bigger than one. So if, for example, if theta is seven over here on the right side, no way, no value of theta is going to make sine bigger than one. So that sine theta will always be less than or equal to seven. Same thing down here with cosine, when theta is big, cosine is never bigger than uh, one or smaller than negative one, so this quantity does not get very big or very small either. Now what about when theta is close to zero? So we're gonna see why these are true. So I'm gonna draw the, I'm not gonna draw the full unit circle, we only need the right part of it, because I only need to worry about when theta is small and here at pi over two and negative pi over two. Negative pi over two, I'm sorry if you can hear my dog making noise. Uh, pi over two is bigger than one, negative pi over two is, I would say bigger than negative one, although technically smaller than negative one is the right way to say it. So one and negative one would probably be somewhere right about there. We don't generally measure radian angles without a pi in them, but one and negative one will be somewhere about right there. So this should cover us for all angles small, uh, close to zero. So let, let's measure, let's take some angle right here, theta. And I'll zoom in a little bit more. And we got one right there. So I'm gonna, I'll just use, I'll make things bold when I want to measure them. So this arc right here, we're on the unit circle. So our arc is actually just theta itself. So where does that come from? S equals R theta, this is arc length. R radius on the unit circle is one. So for us, S equals one theta or just S equals theta. So this arc length right here that I just highlighted or just made bold is actually theta. It's a little weird, but that's the reason radians were chosen so that on a unit circle, your arc length is actually the same number as your angle measurement. So there's our arc length theta. What is our vertical side right here? So I'll make that bold. Our vertical side in our triangle, we normally call it y, but remember y is sine theta. So let's write that here. So that is sine theta. Now which of these two is shorter? So if you think about starting at that point right there, what is a shorter route to the x-axis? Straight down or take the curve? So it should be obvious, straight down is the shorter distance to the x-axis. So that means the straight down segment is shorter than the uh, curved segment right here. So that gives us the inequality Now I made some assumptions here. Uh, the main assumption we made is that theta is positive. Theta is greater than zero. So if theta is less than zero, uh, this on the right side will be negative. So one thing we can do, 
we can absolute value that. So that if theta is negative, this absolute value of theta will be uh, positive. And what happens if we have a negative theta? If theta is negative down here, we can play the same game. So at that point, here's our sine theta, and here is in the blue. Now, technically, I could write theta right here, but if theta is negative, this would be a negative measurement. So what I'm going to do instead, we could absolute value this as well. So I want to count it as the uh, positive measurement of this arc right here. And this will be sine, sine theta. So which one is bigger? Our absolute value theta is bigger than sine theta. Now everything is messed up when you're dealing with negatives. So to put this properly in order, it looks like this. So these are tricky to think about. But what this says is negative, the arc length, is a smaller number than the vertical distance right here. The vertical distance is going to be measured as negative as well. So this, I like to say this is a bigger negative number than this right here. So I'm circling them with the pen so you can see them. Our absolute value theta, uh, when I put a negative in front of it, will be a bigger negative number than sine theta. So that's where the other inequality comes from. So we're going to do something very similar. And I don't want to use red because I generally save that for things that are wrong. Draw, there we go, green, okay. So let's measure horizontal, uh-oh, that's not what I want. I'll measure this horizontal distance right here. So what is a horizontal distance? It is, what's missing is cosine theta. So cos theta would be this measurement right here. Uh, what about the piece we actually want? Go over to one and then subtract cos theta. So this piece we actually are interested in is one minus cos theta. That's the green measurement that I made in bold right there. So which one is shorter or which one is smaller? So I'm going to shade this back in in green now. Is the arc length bigger or one minus cos theta bigger? And you should be able to tell to go from this point here on the far right of the circle um, to the left is way shorter to go one minus cos theta than it is to go the long way around here, theta. So we have the same problem before where uh, theta is negative, everything breaks down. So you put an absolute value, <coughs> if theta is negative, then uh, absolute value will be positive. And you can play the same game by measuring this short distance here if theta is negative. And you'll have the exact same property you did before. So I'm not going to say memorize these because what we're going to do with these is actually use them for other things that you're going to have to memorize those other things. So I'm not going to say memorize these, uh, but we will use them. And this is uh, why they're true. So that's the end of pre-calculus review. So now we're going to get into 2.1, which is actually calculus. And the first topic is rates of change and tangents to curves. So first topic is we're going to talk about average versus instantaneous speed. I think that should be a G ever age. Uh, versus 
instantaneous speed. All right, what's the difference? Well, most of us drive, uh, except me today. I'm not driving through the ice. But generally, most of us drive, or at least have been in a car, and uh, looked at a speedometer. So the speedometer tells you how fast you're currently going, which would be your instantaneous speed. No matter what, you're never going to have the same instantaneous speed your entire drive, uh, unless you jumped in a car that already had the cruise control on, and the way you exited the car was you jumped out of it, while it was still moving. I don't recommend this ever. Uh, so generally you're gonna get into a car when it stopped and you're gonna get out of the car when it stopped, but it was not stopped the entire time or that was pretty pointless. So you drove somewhere. And your instantaneous speed started at zero, should end at zero at the end of your trip and was probably not zero during your trip. So may have uh, gone in reverse to get out of the parking lot, and a parking spot and then started driving forward. What is average speed? Average speed is uh, you take your total distance you traveled and divide it by your time. So the number of miles you went divided by the number of hours it took will give you miles per hour. So some cars have an average speed uh, computation in it, like probably called, I don't know, trip speed, something like that. My car doesn't. A lot of cars don't, will not tell you your average trip speed. You'd have to compute it yourself with a stopwatch and look look at your odometer before you left and then at when you arrive. So that is how average versus instantaneous speed uh, as an example for us that we use most every day and we're going to look at a uh, free fall so an object free falling. So we have a free fall equation y equals 16 t squared and y is a distance in feet so this is free fall equation y equals distance in feet uh, after t seconds so if something falls for zero seconds it will travel travel zero feet if it falls for one second, it will travel 16 feet. Now, if it falls for two seconds, you put two in for T, it will travel, uh, that's a little tough. Let's make, we'll make it short very soon. Actually, might as well do it right now. So these are just some T values and then our corresponding Y values. So we'll start zero seconds, it fell zero feet. One second, it falls 16 times 1 squared, which is 16. Two seconds, how far does it fall? 16 times 2 squared, which is 16 times 4, 64. If I did three seconds, we'll see how my math skills are, or I should say my arithmetic skills. Uh, three squared is nine, whatever 16 times nine is, uh-oh, uh, a lot. One forty something, no, yes, one forty four, something like that. That sounds pretty reasonable. So you'll see that you fall quite a bit further. And if I would, I'm not going to attempt to go uh, four, five and six, but you start falling really big distances. Uh, for any physics, uh, people actually care about physics and air resistance, this neglects air resistance. So the actual free fall equation, including air resistance, is a bit more complicated, but this is in a vacuum. Uh, or if something very uh, dense, very heavy and small uh, fell, like a, uh, a rock, would this would be very accurate accurate until it got to a very high velocity, in which case air resistance would be more significant. Uh, but certainly dropping a penny off of uh, uh, 100 feet, this would be pretty accurate overall. All right, average speed. Let's get the actual formula. I talked about it. We'll write it down. So average speed. <coughs> 
Actually, we'll go average velocity. Let's use a V for velocity, and the way we generally write average is a vertical bar over top. So what is this? This will be change in, we got Y for our uh, distance here. Y is a distance, so delta Y is change in Y divided by a change in time. So it's V bar, so this is change in Y. divided by a change in t. So delta is a Greek letter and it means change in. So change in y divided by a change in t. And of course this is distance traveled divided by time. So that's what change in y divided by change in t uh, represents. So we're going to do some computations here. So first example, what is the average speed during the first one second and average speed or for the first two seconds? Average speed or velocity. Now, I could say the first two seconds, but let's use interval notation and average velocity on the interval zero to two. So between zero seconds to two seconds, if we measured that, what would be our average velocity? So how far, obviously we're going for two seconds, so that's change in T, but we have to get our uh, distance. So our delta Y is going to be up here. Let's give this, uh, uh oh, we'll call it f of t. So our function has a name. So delta y is going to be f of 2 minus f of 0. And that's why we made the chart. f of 2 is 64, f of 0 is 0. 64, if we're into units, we can, 64 feet. All right, it's delta y. Delta t, super easy, two minus zero is two. Now any of these, no matter which ones you're doing, they're always gonna be end minus start. You're gonna see that come up over and over, and then over and over again. So these are all gonna be end minus start, end minus start. Of course, this is end distance minus start distance, end time minus start time. So our average velocity, F2 minus F0 divided by two minus zero, and we just did all this computation, 64 over two, 32, and this is measured in, we got feet on the top and seconds on the bottom. So we can write this as feet divided by seconds, or feet per second is another way to write or say this. So we get 32 feet per second. All right, that's our average velocity on zero two. Next up, find average velocity on t in the interval one to two. So this will be starting one second after it fell. So go ahead right now and see if you can get this uh, number. Exact same process, just use one and two instead of zero and two. So take 30 seconds uh, and do this. If it takes more than 30 seconds, good news is you can pause the video and keep going yourself. So I'll give you 30 seconds right now to do it and then I will write it all down very quickly after that. I'm also trying to eat my breakfast quietly because uh, this is the second video of the morning and I haven't eaten anything yet.
So hopefully all of my arithmetic's right. We should get <clears throat> 48 and of course feet per second. You can definitely write it as per second like that if you want to write it in a more English way. Uh, I think most speedometers will say miles per hour with a uh, division sign, M, P, H, or either M divided by H, or some of them will say M, P, H, miles per hour. But either way, it's the same units. All right, so where do we have faster average speed? And if you look, we're traveling uh, 48 feet per second versus 32. So we did travel further in the first example. We traveled further, we went at 64 feet, but because it took two seconds, we had a lower average. The second example, we only went 48 feet, but we did it in one second. So we had a higher average speed for our second example. So our next example, find the instantaneous speed. at t equals one second. So I've not given you a formula for instantaneous speed or a way to compute it. So we cannot directly do it. What we can do is think about what if I use average speed in this interval? We'll start the timer at one second and stop it really quickly after that, after one tenth of one second later. So this entire interval is one tenth of one second. So very small interval. So we can go ahead and do this computation. Uh, the tricky part, what is f of 1.1? 1 .1? Uh, bum, bum, bum. Oh man, I don't have that written down and I'm really bad at arithmetic, so I think we can get this though. 16, 1.1 squared. All right, 11 squared is 121. Uh, whatever number this is uh, will be our f of 1.1. And then I could do f of 1.1 minus, oh, could do better handwriting than that. 1.1 minus f of 1 over 1.1 minus 1. And let's see, f of 1.1, 16 times 1.21 minus 16 divided by 0.1 is 16 times Two one minus one divided by uh, point one is one tenth. So it has one tenth. Now one point two one minus one is point two one. Easy stuff. One tenth. Let's multiply by the reciprocal, which is ten. Ten over one. Uh, Sixteen times. 2.1, I think, hopefully I can handle this. So 16 times two is 32, plus a tenth times 16, 1.6, that'll be 33.6. Let's see, yep, that is the right answer, okay. And if you're wondering what, how did I turn multiplication to addition, I did, uh, what do we call this? long multiplication or whatever, where you multiply your two times 16 first, get that, and then uh, add that to 0.1 times 16. Uh, it's usually written something like that, but I didn't feel like writing it like that. You've probably done enough multiplication to follow along with the way I did it there. All right, is this instantaneous speed? No, instantaneous speed would not go from one second to a later time. So unfortunately, we cannot directly get this until we actually do calculus. But what we can do is we can get a 
better and better and better number. How do I get a better and better number? What I do is stop, instead of at 1.1, I stop at smaller numbers. So I can get a better, so this is an estimate. Let me write that down, this is our estimate. I can get a better estimate by using, so for example, a more accurate stopwatch using a smaller time interval. So even better. Go from one to 1.001. And I could write even better, even better, even better. So we can keep getting more um, closer to one. Now if we're gonna be starting these computations, let's get a formula, which so we're gonna derive for average velocity when uh, our interval is, we're gonna go from t to t plus h. So we're gonna start our timer at t, end it at t plus h, so we're gonna go for h seconds. Uh, and you'll see all this work out. So average velocity, f of, we're taking our second, our end time, t plus h, minus f of our start time, t, divided by t plus h, minus our start time, which is t. It's a really good time to make sure your t's do not look like your pluses. So I fix that, or mostly fix that, by giving my t's a little foot. So I make my t's curved. I think I have a different t when I write in English words than when I write math t's. And you can see it happening right here. So, well, maybe my English t's have feet too. Not relevant. T plus H minus T is H. So this should hopefully turn on a light bulb in your head. This right here is the difference quotient. This will become your best friend or worst enemy, but hopefully your best friend throughout this quarter. And let's see, difference quotient. All right, I think this is a good place to end. We're gonna use this with some computations. And uh, the specific example we just did, we'll rework it with uh, the difference quotient. So again, quiz tomorrow, be ready for it, 1.1 through 1.2. And I won't put trig on your quiz because I just finished trig today.